So type 2 failure, this is again something that's important, frequently repeated. So usually what happens is the questions describe a type 2 failure and they say that this is in an asthma patient or in a COPD patient and the management is different for both. So if you have a type 2 failure which is not responding to medical management in a COPD patient, your next line of approach is going to be NIV, not intubation. Whereas in an asthma patient, when the patient is in type 2 failure, worsening type 2 failure, not responding to medical management, there is no role for NIV. You directly have to intubate and put the patient on mechanical ventilation. This is something that's very important to remember. So, COPD type 2 failure, NIV, asthma type 2 failure, intubate. Now, long-term oxygen uh, therapy, this is again something that is important to remember, again frequently repeated. So, when you have COPD patients, where all is LTOT indicated? When do you prescribe LTOT? So, one, when the PO2 is going to be less than 7.3. Two, sometimes in patients, PO2 is going to be above 7.3. So, PO2 between 7.3 to 7.8. But, the patient has one of the three Ps. What is that? Patient either has pulmonary artery hypertension or the patient has secondary polycythemia or the patient has peripheral edema. So, basically core pulmonary. These three Ps, even at a better, even at a slightly, this is not 7.3 to 7.8, this is 8, sorry. So, whenever you have a PAO2 less than 7.3 in patients with COPD, LTOT is indicated. If not, if the PAO2 is going to be between 7.3 and 8, but still patient has one of these three Ps, polycythemia, secondary polycythemia, PAH, pulmonary artery hypertension or core pulmonary. So, any of these instances, the patient requires LTOT. These are the four major indications for LTOT. PAO2 less than 7.3, PAO2 less than 8, but more than 7.3. But still patient has core pulmonal, PAH or secondary polycythemia. Now, most common mutation in cystic fibrosis is the F508 del type 2 defect. Most common idiopathic interstitial pneumonia is the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, which is more common in males. Clubbing is commonly seen, lower low predominant. You have a UIP pattern on pathology, honeycombing on CT. That's the entity we are talking about. Most common connective tissue disorder which is associated with ILD is going to be systemic sclerosis. Most common malignancy associated with asbestos exposure is going to be CA lung, not mesothelioma. But the most common cause of mesothelioma is going to be asbestos exposure. The most common cause of pleural effusion is a transudative effusion which is LV failure. But the most common cause of exudative pleural effusion is often infection, paranumonic. Second most common is only malignancy, CA breast, lung or lymphoma. Most common type of pulmonary hypertension is actually type 2 which is associated with a left heart disease. And the most common cause of hemoptysis in UK is actually infection, either a LRTI, lower respiratory tract infection or a COPD exacerbation. Now, let's look at a few other syndromes. Now, whenever uh, you have uh, descriptions of cases, and they describe a lung involvement plus a pancreas involvement. So, there is description of bronchiectasis in a patient with features of pancreatic insufficiency. Think about cystic fibrosis. Whenever there is description of lung involvement, particularly in the form of emphysema and a liver involvement, think about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Usually, these patients have a pan SNR emphysema. Whenever there is description of a pneumonia in an alcoholic, remember that this is usually going to be an aspiration pneumonia. In case they describe a community acquired pneumonia in an alcoholic and particularly when there is mention of a cavity, remember that the common etiological agent is going to be Klebsiella. Whenever there is description of hemoptysis in a smoker, so usually the case history starts off like this. There is a smoker, patient comes to you with hemoptysis on Reviewing the history, you find that the patient has had a recent uh, respiratory tract infection and your urine examination reveals significant hematuria, proteinuria and a renal and there is also presence of elevated creatinine on your biochemical investigation. So, this picture where there is a uh, smoker, hemoptysis, renal failure, a glomerular involvement, a glomerulonephritis picture 
and history of a previous respiratory infection, you are looking at good pastures. So, when there is description of a respiratory tract infection and within a few days, two or three days itself, uh, the case describes that the patient has developed a cross hematuria, significant blood in the urine but no protein in the urine. This picture is that of IgA nephropathy. Remember, in patients with IgA nephropathy, we most of them spontaneously remit and we need not treat in the absence of proteinuria or renal impairment. Now, whenever this same respiratory infection occurs, but two to three weeks later, there is description of a glomerulonephritis. Here, there is not only hematuria, but also proteinuria. Then it is not IgA nephropathy. We are looking at post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Now, when there is a case of hemoptysis with some sinonasal involvement, could be a nasal bridge collapse or frequent previous sinonasal infections and then there is also a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, then we are talking about a GPA, vaginous granulomatosis, C. anka is usually positive. Now, when there is mention of worsening of asthma with eosinophilia with the glomerulonephritis, then this is EPA, eosinophilic polyangitis. This is associated with P. Anka. Now, upper lobe of emphysema following childhood bronchiolitis, we are talking about McLeod syndrome, whereas in a patient when there is description of pneumothorax with fibrofolliculomas, with lung cysts and renal cancer, this is the Berthog Dubé syndrome. The two syndromes which stood out in the MRCB questions, two rare syndromes, so good to know. Now, in pulmonology, it is very important to remember the handful of diseases which have upper lobe involvement. The vast majority of them have lower lobe involvement. So, what are these upper lobe involving diseases? I remember them using this mnemonic called BRASH. B stands for berylosis, R stands for radiation, A stands for ankylosing spondylitis and ABPA, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. S stands for both sarcoidosis and silicosis. H stands for hypersensitive pneumonitis and in addition to this what is the other disease that you should remember TB. TB also has upper lobe involvement. Now particularly when we are looking at uh, distribution of bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis and radiation usually causes upper lobe bronchiectasis, immortal celiac syndromes and uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria cause middle lobe bronchiectasis. Traction bronchiectasis, those associated with scleroderma are all causing lower lobe bronchiectasis and finally ABPA can cause central bronchiectasis. Now, as far as emphysema is concerned, centrius in our emphysema seen in smokers is usually an upper lobe emphysema whereas pan in our emphysema seen in alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency is a lower lobe emphysema. Now, uh, when we look at ILDs, this is what we already covered. So, berylosis, uh, radiation therapy, ankylosis, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, sarcoidosis, silicosis, hypersensitive pneumonitis, all these cause upper lobe predominant ILD. Most other ILDs are going to be lower lobe predominant. Now, sarcoidosis is again something that we should all try to understand and keep in mind. Few salient features that are often uh, mentioned in the MRCP questions. One, when there is an elaborate description of a patient with acute sarcoidosis, often the diagnosis itself is mentioned in the question and they ask you how you go forward with the treatment. Remember that in 60% of cases, there is going to be spontaneous remission. Now, the scarring and worms stages in chest x-ray, there are four stages. So, uh, stage 1, there is only hilar lymphadenopathy. Stage 2, there is adenopathy and parenchymal disease. Stage 3 is only parenchymal disease and stage 4, there is going to be fibrosis. These are the four stages. So, they may describe an x-ray to you and ask you which stage of sarcoidosis the patient is in and this is what you use. So, only hilar adenopathy 1. Only parenchymal involvement 3, both are present stage 2 and fibrosis is 4. Aspergillus, aspergillus infections of the lung, again frequently asked in MRCP exams. So, when there is description of a patient with cough, hemoptysis, plus or minus a fungal ball with some precipitins, IgG precipitins and exposure, this picture suggests a chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. So, remember cough, hemoptysis, fungal ball with IgG precipitants goes more in favor of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. Now, you have IgE precipitants and you have V is eosinophilia, fleeting pulmonary infiltrates, central bronchiectasis. 
This goes more in favor of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And finally, you have description of an aspergillus infection in an immunocompromised patient. Patient is in sepsis. There is also respiratory failure. Here we are talking about invasive aspergillosis. Now, pleural fluid. A lot of questions about and around pleural effusion. So, this is again something that we should all know about. Now, when you have pleural fluid eosinophilia, one thing that we can be sure of is that it is unlikely to be malignancy or TB. When pleural fluid ANA itself is positive, then you are looking at SLE. When there is a heavy blood staining of pleural fluid, two possibilities. Either it is a pulmonary infarction or it is a malignancy. When there is low glucose in the pleural fluid, remember RIM. So, rheumatoid arthritis, infection or malignancy. So, rheumatoid arthritis, infection or malignancy. Meig syndrome. So, two syndromes which are associated with pleural effusion. One is Meig syndrome. So, here usually will be described about a right-sided pleural effusion, a right-sided exudative pleural effusion. In addition, the case also describes about a benign ovarian tumor and ascites. Here, we are dealing with Meig syndrome. Remember, Gollin syndrome is when there is a young patient with a strong family history because it is an autosomal dominant syndrome and the patient also has a ovarian tumor and a basal cell carcinoma. Yellow nail syndrome is the other pleural effusion syndrome. So, when you have pleural effusion, a chylus pleural effusion along with lymphedema and nail dystrophy, think about yellow nail syndrome. So, two syndromes associated with pleural effusion. Ovarian tumor and exudative pleural effusion, you are thinking about Meig syndrome. Similarly, you have a chylus pleural effusion with lymphedema and nail dystrophy, you are looking at yellow nail syndrome. Now, eosinophilic pleural effusion can be seen in fungal parasitic infections, polyarthritis nodosa, eosinophilic polyangitis, drugs, asbestos, trauma and pulmonary infarction and also in hemothorax. Now, eosinophilic bowel on the other hand can be seen in acute eosinophilic pneumonia, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia and eosinophilic polyangitis. These are the three conditions with the eosinophilic bowel. So, eosinophilic pneumonias and eosinophilic polyangitis. Now, a lymphocytic pleural effusion can be seen in TB, in lymphoma, sarcoidosis, chylothorax and also in yellow nail syndrome. As I mentioned earlier, lymphocytic bowel usually has two differentials. Either you are looking at sarcoidosis or you are looking at hypersensitive pneumonitis. And what is going to help us in differentiating the two is the, so CD4, CD8 ratio is more than one. In a patient with a lymphocytic bowel, you are looking at sarcoidosis. If the CD4, CD8 ratio is less than one, in a patient with lymphocytic bowel, you are looking at hypersensitive pneumonitis. So, remember, both these conditions have a lymphocytic bowel. So, you look at the CD4, CD8 ratio. If this ratio is going to be more than 1, it is sarcoid. If it is less than 1, hypersensitive pneumonitis. So, I remember this again based on alphabetical order. H comes first. So, H has the lower number and S comes later. S has the higher number. Now, pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is again a hot favorite topic as far as MRCP1 is concerned. Few things that we should definitely know about pulmonary embolism. The clinical features that are going to be most suggestive of pulmonary embolism is going to be the pleuritic chest pain followed by tachypnea, hemoptysis and tachycardia. However, the most common clinical feature is tachypnea and the most common chest x-ray finding is a normal chest x-ray and the most common ECG finding is going to be sinus tachycardia. So, remember all of this, the feature that is most suggestive is a pleuritic chest pain but the most common clinical feature is tachypnea, most common ECG finding is sinus tachycardia and most common chest x-ray is a normal chest x-ray. Now, how will you treat these patients? When there is description of a provoked pulmonary embolism, then we treat them with anticoagulation for three months. So, let's say the patient is immobilized or following a fracture, the patient has developed P. These are provoked pulmonary embolism. You treat them with three months anticoagulation. When you have a provoked pulmonary embolism in a patient with an active malignancy, then you can extend it even up to six months. When there is an unprovoked pulmonary embolism, no risk factors determined, you treat the patient for 3 months, review for risk factors, assess for thrombophilia and if there are uh, risk factors which are persisting, let's say uh, initially when the pulmonary embolism happened, the patient was ambulant but now the patient is bed bound, uh, the patient is immobile, that means the risk factors for PE are persisting, continuing. So, in that case or you have a thrombophilia diagnosed, in such instances you will have to continue beyond 6 months. 
Now, unprovoked with an active malignancy, you will have to give the patient anticoagulation for six months. And whenever the patient has a recurrent pulmonary embolism, so second episode of VT, then you will have to give them indefinite lifelong anticoagulation. So remember this: provoked three months only, provoked in a patient with active malignancy up to six months, unprovoked again three months, VSS, and then take a call on whether or not you are going to continue, depending on whether risk factors or thrombophilias are present. Unprovoked in a patient with active malignancy for six months, recurrent is lifelong. Pneumothorax, this is something that we should all be thorough uh, with because again frequently asked in MRCP1. So as far as management of pneumothorax is concerned, one important thing that you should all remember is that whenever there is a mention of a spontaneous pneumothorax and when the question asks as to what should the patient, which of the following statements is true or false or either way. Remember that all these patients with spontaneous pneumothorax should avoid scuba diving lifelong, moving forward indefinitely. So, this is very, very important. All patients with spontaneous pneumothorax, they need to avoid scuba diving lifelong. Now, as far as management is concerned, we will have to divide them into primary spontaneous pneumothorax or secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. Now, primary spontaneous pneumothorax basically means there is no underlying lung disease. Secondary spontaneous pneumothorax is something that is occurring in a patient with an underlying lung disease like emphysema or a lung, cystic lung disease. So, you have a primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Here, the cutoff is going to be 2 cm. So, if the size is going to be more than 2 cm or if the patient is symptomatic, then what do we do? We aspirate. If after aspiration, there is still more than 2 centimeters of pneumothorax, then we will have to insert an ICD, an intercostal drain. So, in a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, if the size is less than 2 cm and if the patient is asymptomatic, only then will you discharge the patient. So, remember, primary spontaneous pneumothorax, symptomatic or if the size is more than 2 cm, aspirate, if it fails, ICD, less than 2 and asymptomatic, directly discharge. Secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, here the cutoff is going to be 1. Now, even if the size is going to be less than 1 cm and if the patient is going to be asymptomatic, you still do not discharge the patient if it is a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. What do you do? You admit, start the patient on high flow oxygen and you observe for reduction in the size of the pneumothorax. Now, if the size is going to be more than 2 cm or if the patient is breathless, remember if this was the situation in a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, we had to aspirate. Whereas, same situation in a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, you opt for ICD. And uh, what is the role of aspiration in a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax then? That is for the intermediary. So, size between 1 to 2 cm, that is the role of aspiration. You aspirate. If still more than 1 cm, then aspiration has failed and you will have to opt for an ICD. Now, recurrent pneumothorax, when the patient develops pneumothorax in a recurrent manner, then you will have to opt for pleurodesis. Remember, whenever you have a case being described of a pneumothorax where they have aspirated and even after aspiration of 2.5 liters, still chest x-ray shows evidence of pneumothorax. Remember what I said? For aspiration to have failed, that means there needs to be more than 2 cm pneumothorax if it is a primary spontaneous pneumothorax and more than 1 cm if it is a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. So, if aspiration has failed even after 2.5 liters or uh, either on the chest x-ray based on these radiological criteria or if the patient is still symptomatic, we will have to opt for intercostal drain. And finally, despite being on the ICD, if there is still failure to re-expand, or if there is persistent air leak beyond 48 hours. So, 48 hours is when we would reassess following the ICD. At that point, what do you do? You will have to offer the patient negative suction. Now, this negative suction will be a high volume, low pressure suction. Now, this is how you measure the pneumothorax. So, as far as MRCP is concerned, we are looking at the British guidelines only. So, where are you going to measure? This is again something that is asked in questions. Where do you measure the size of the pneumothorax? As far as the British guidelines are concerned, you measure the interpleural distance at the level of the hilum. So, when I say 1 centimeter, 2 centimeter, this is the gap that I am talking about. Now, it is also good to know. Uh, that uh, the American guidelines, uh, they define the size of the pneumothorax based on the apex to cupola uh, distance. 
So generally, based on the British guidelines, this distance that we see, the interpleural distance at the level of the hilum, if it's less than 2 cm, you're dealing with a small pneumothorax. If it's more than 2 cm, you're dealing with a large pneumothorax. Now to recap the same things that we learnt here. So when you have a spontaneous pneumothorax, if the age is more than 50 and if there is significant smoking history or an underlying lung disease, then we are looking at a secondary pneumothorax. If that is not the case, there is no smoking history, no underlying lung disease, younger patient, then we are looking at a primary spontaneous pneumothorax. So in that case, if the size is going to be more than 2 centimeters, and or, or if there are going to be symptoms, then we will have to aspirate. And following aspiration, it has to improve. If it doesn't improve, the size of the pneumothorax continues to be above 2 cm, then we'll have to opt for ICD. If the uh, size is going to be less than 2 cm and if there are no symptoms, or uh, after aspiration, if the size has reduced to less than 2 cm, no symptoms, at that point we can discharge the patient. Now, in some patients with a large pneumothorax, but they have relatively few symptoms, in such patients also, conservative management may still be appropriate. It's, it's important to remember that. Now, when you have a secondary pneumothorax and uh, the size is going to be either more than 2 cm or the patient is breathless, here, so this is the parallel of what we saw in primary spontaneous pneumothorax, where if these conditions were fulfilled, we were going to opt for aspiration. So, if these criteria are fulfilled in a secondary pneumothorax, no aspiration, directly ICD. Similarly, in a primary uh, spontaneous pneumothorax, if aspiration fails also, you will have to opt for ICD. So, one of the major things to remember here is, remember, both in a primary and a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, size more than 2 cm or if the patient is breathless, they require an intervention. The intervention is going to be different. It's going to be aspiration. Only if aspiration fails, you're going to opt for ICD in a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, whereas the very first intervention is going to be ICD in secondary pneumothorax. Now, uh, what happens here, the size is going to be less than 1 cm and if the patient is asymptomatic, even then we would still admit, give the patient oxygen and observe. But if the size is going to be between 1 to 2 cm, then we are going to aspirate. If aspiration is successful, great. If the aspiration is not successful, then ICD. So, all the other individuals are still going to be admitted and on high flow oxygen and observed as far as secondary pneumothorax is concerned. Now, lung malignancy, again something that's very important to remember. A lot of questions on lung malignancy are asked. So, what are the things that we should remember as far as uh, lung malignancy is concerned? One, the most common malignancy in the lungs, remember, is going to be secondaries, not a primary lung malignancy. So, the most common malignancy cancer in the lung is a secondary. Now, as far as secondaries in the lungs are concerned, when these lung metastases appear calcified, then you are looking at either a primary in the thyroid, in the form of papillary thyroid carcinoma, or you are looking at chondro or osteosarcoma. When you are described of miliary lung metastases, then the primary is either a renal cell carcinoma or a malignant melanoma. When the metastases from lung carcinoma are going to be described, then that is more common in breast, followed by liver, followed by bone and adrenal. So, remember, here I am not talking about the lung meds. I am talking about the secondaries from a primary lung malignancy. The most common site for secondaries from a lung malignancy is breast. We are able to see that adrenals are the least common site of secondaries from a lung primary. However, the most common primary, if at all you find an adrenal met, is going to be carcinoma lung. Got it? So, it's very strange in the sense that you'll have to understand that amongst the organs which can have secondaries from a primary lung malignancy, breast is the commonest and adrenals are the rarest. But if an adrenal secondary is reported, the most common primary is going to be CA lung. Now, as far as primary lung malignancies are concerned, squamous cell carcinomas and adenocarcinomas are very, very common. That's followed by small cell lung carcinoma, followed by large cell lung carcinoma, followed by bronchoalveolar carcinoma. Now, when you're being described of a lung malignancy, which is peripheral in a non-smoker, you're looking at adenocarcinoma. Remember, very important. 
peripheral mass in a non smoker likely to be adenocarcinoma now when you are described of a lung mass in a smoker and usually central now smoking associated lung malignancies can be either scc squamous cell carcinoma or small cell lung carcinoma but which is more common scc squamous cell carcinoma is more common so in such an instance whenever you described of a lung mass in a smoker so we are going to use other clues to see if it is scc or sclc so amongst the paraneoplastic syndromes hypercalcemia is the only one that is more common with scc so you are being described a lung mass in a smoker with hypercalcemia you are dealing with a squamous cell carcinoma whereas if you are being described of a lung mass in a smoker but it has a very rapid progression most of these cases they would have mentioned of a normal x-ray 3 months ago so that means that this is a very rapidly progressing tumor and there is also mention of other paraneoplastic syndromes could be ectopic ACTH secreting Cushing's or could be hyponatremia SADH this kind of a picture then you are going to opt for SCLC small cell lung carcinoma so as I said rapid progression any lung tumor with a rapid progression think about SCLC only that is why it carries a very poor prognosis now presentation of non small cell lung carcinoma cough is more common than breathlessness for non small cell lung carcinoma alone breathlessness is not the predominant feature presenting feature it's going to be cough now as i said the most common malignancy associated with hypercalcemia is squamous cell carcinoma and here the hypercalcemia is mediated through the pthrp pth related peptide all other paraneoplastic syndromes are going to be more common with sclc small cell lung carcinoma now similarly the most common lung malignancy associated with a pancos tumor that again is going to be scc the most common cause of clubbing is going to be adenocarcinoma lung not scc adenocarcinoma more common than squamous cell carcinoma so both hypercalcemia and pancos both are common with squamous cell carcinoma similarly remember superior vena cava syndrome and all the other paraneoplastic syndromes are more common with small cell lung carcinoma so hypercalcemia and pancos you are looking at squamous cell carcinoma so all other paraneoplastic syndromes and svc syndrome you are looking at small cell lung carcinoma and clubbing you are looking at which is the alphabet closest to c it is a adenocarcinoma now similarly most common lung malignancy from a scar tissue this is very unique most other places which is a malignancy that develops in a scar tissue it is going to be squamous cell carcinoma but only in the lung lung is the only exception to that in the lung the most common lung malignancy from a scar tissue is going to be an adenocarcinoma similarly the most common carcinoma lung carcinoma with the cavity is going to be squamous cell carcinoma and the most common lung malignancy in the entire world is actually adenocarcinoma so remember the lung malignancy most commonly presenting with a cavity or with hypercalcemia or pancos so i would say remember c calcium cavity coast pancos all is going to be scc squamous cell carcinoma paraneoplastic syndrome and svc syndrome both these are going to be seen with small cell lung carcinoma and finally so i think this we can remember as pqrs q nothing q you read the question p is going to be paraneoplastic syndromes r is going to be rapid progression s is going to be svc syndrome so pqrs for small cell lung carcinoma and uh, the most common lung malignancy in the world the most common lung malignancy associated with clubbing or with scar tissue is going to be adenocarcinoma so very very important facts to be kept in mind now this is again important a few questions they describe a lung malignancy and they ask you to pick out the stage of the lung malignancy for that reason you need to know this complicated table i'll try to make understanding this table a little easier now Uh, as far as t is concerned this is the tnm classification so t stands for tumor characteristics n stands for nodes and m stands for metastases as seen here m0 means no mets m1 means mets present that's all it is 
Now, T, there are four characteristics. We're going to describe the size of the tumor, the uh, endobronchial location, whether there is invasion and other characteristics. Now, let's take T1. T1 is a small tumor, less than 3 cm. There is no invasion proximal to the lobar bronchus and uh, this is usually surrounded by the lung or the visceral pleura. So, a small tumor limited to the visceral pleura or to the lung with no significant local invasion is a T1 tumor. Now, T1 N0, so this is all it is. You picked up a small tumor sitting confined to the lung or the visceral pleura, less than 3 cm. No, no, you are looking at a stage 1A tumor. Now, T2 is a tumor which is going to be more than 3 centimeters. Now, here there may be involvement of the main bronchus, but uh, it should be at least 2 centimeter away from the carina. So, not very close to the carina. So, involvement of the main bronchus, but not close to the carina. Involvement of visceral pleura. And the patient may also have atelectasis or obstructive pneumonitis, which extends to the hilar region, but doesn't necessarily involve the entire lung. So, this kind of a picture. A segment like lectasis, involvement of the visceral pleura, uh, invasion of the bronchus, but there should be at least a 2 cm gap between the carina and the lesion, and size more than 3 cm. This is T2. Now, whenever there is T2 and still no nodes, this is stage 1b. So, T1 no nodes, stage 1a. T2 no nodes is stage 1b, but still all stage 1. So, N0 is all stage 1. Now, T3, any size of the tumor, any size of tumor, but problem is the main bronchus is involved very close to the carina, so within 2 centimeters from the carina. There may be infiltration of either the chest wall, the parietal pleura, the parietal pericardium or the diaphragm and uh, there is atelectasis of the entire lung. This picture is T3. So, irrespective of the size, uh, significant bronchial in involvement very close to the carina, or involvement of the parietal pleura, parietal pericardium, or diaphragm, or uh, atelectasis of the entire lung is T3. Whenever there is T3 and still no nodes, this is stage 2b. Now, what is stage 2a then? So, stage 2a is basically T1 with nodes. That is stage 2a. So, remember T1 with no nodes is stage 1a. T2 with no nodes is stage 1b. Then in the same way, T1 with nodes is stage 2a. So, remember stage 1, n is always going to be 0. In stage 2, either you have less advanced tumor with a node. So, it is T1 uh, n1 or T2 N1, this is all going to be stage 2. Now, T3, N0 or a more advanced tumor without a node involvement. Both these, T2, N1 and T3, N0, both these are going to be 2B. So, again here, when you look at stage 3, you will be able to see that either there is an advanced node involvement in a small tumor. So, T1, N2 or T2, N2 or an advanced tumor T3 with any node T3, N1, T3, N2, this, this is stage 3. So, when you look at this, your T1, N2, your T2, N2, your T3, N1 and N2, all of this is going to be stage 3A, all right. Now, when you look at T4, T4 is basically any size of tumor. Here the problem is there is involvement of mediastinum, involvement of trachea, heart, great vessels, esophagus, vertebral body or there is a malignant pleural or pericardial effusion. Very, very important. Remember this even if you don't remember anything else because a lot of questions describe about a malignant pleural effusion and immediately you should know the stage. So, whenever there is a malignant pleural effusion, this, the TNM classification already goes to T4. And then depending on the other things, you will describe the stage. So, at this stage, when the patient has a T4 tumor, again you look at the nodes. So, T4 N3, that means the node is also advanced, the tumor is also advanced, that is stage 3B. And so, one thing that is evident from here is 
T4 with any n could be n0, uh, n1, n2, n3, any n. So, T4 any n. Similarly, n3 any t or rather I should write it as any t and n3. This makes up your stage 3 B. Got it? So, and finally, after this, we come to stage 4. What is stage 4? Stage 4 is very simple. Any t, any n and m1. So, up to stage 4, everything else is going to be m0. Once you say there is m1, then the patient is automatically in stage 4. Now, before moving forward, just a few things about what constitutes this N1, N2 and N3. So, when you look here, N1 is presence of ipsilateral peribronchial lymph node uh, and or or ipsilateral hilar lymph node. So, basically ipsilateral closed nodes, either peribronchial or hilar nodes. So, when you look at N2, you are going to have further away nodes, still ipsilateral. So, you will have mediastinal or subcarinal nodes. So, remember N1 is very close. So, peribronchial nodes or you are going to have hilar nodes, ipsilateral and N2 is you are going to have subcarinal nodes or mediastinal nodes. N3 is basically you have developed either contralateral adenopathy, contralateral mediastinal nodes or contralateral hilar nodes or you have developed nodes which are really far away like supraclavicular or scalene nodes. So, that is N3. So, remember that. So, from this the TNM classification is clear. So, again because this malignant pleural effusion is very important. Whenever you are described of a malignant pleural effusion, remember this, even if you do not remember anything else. Remember T4 automatically, when the patient has no metastasis, all T4 is going to be in stage 3B. That is the most important take home from this slide. Now, a few drug interactions which are specifically captured in uh, respiratory questions in MRCP1. So, whenever they describe a patient who is on statin, who has been given a macrolide like clarithromycin for a lower respiratory tract infection, then interactions are expected. So, patient may develop statin-induced myositis or statin-induced rhabdomyolysis. Similarly, increased theophyllin levels may be seen in patients who have been given ciprofloxacin, clarithromycin or OCPs. This is again something that is important and needs to be kept in mind. And whenever you have a patient who has been described uh, of a clinical picture of lung fibrosis and the patient has been let us say on amiodarone for an arrhythmia or the patient has been on methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis, this is the most common cause of this lung fibrosis. Usually, it is a lower lobe fibrosis. Now, contraindications for surgery in carcinoma lung. Uh, remember, when the patient has malignant pleural effusion, then surgery is contraindicated. Similarly, pancose tumor again poses a contraindication for surgery and FEV1 less than 2 liters. These are the uh, four important contraindications for CA lung. So, one malignant pleural effusion, two pancose tumor. So, how I remember two P's? So, pleural effusion. So, how do I remember two P's? Pleural effusion and pancose tumor. This looks like P, not pulmonary embolism. This is pleural effusion. And in addition, two values that we need to remember. One is FEV1 is going to be less than 2 liter, then uh, surgery for carcinoma lung is contraindicated. Similarly, if DLCO is less than, if the reduction in DLCO is by more than 50 percent, so from the baseline. So, if DLCO is reduced by more than 50 percent, that means there is significant lung parenchymal disease, then then again, there is a uh, contraindication for carcinoma lung surgery. Now, what are the contraindications for lung transplantation, particularly in cystic fibrosis? Three important contraindications, malnutrition, an active mycobacterial infection and persistent non-compliance. Because if the patient is not compliant, then following lung transplant, again, when they are going to require a lot of medications, the same attitude is going to follow through. So, non-compliance malnutrition and mycobacterial infection, big no-no for uh, lung transplantation in cystic fibrosis. So, these are the things that we need to remember. We have come to the 
final lap of prep module on respiratory system for MRCP part 1. A quick recall on the important drugs as far as respiratory system is concerned. What is omalizumab? Omalizumab is an anti-IG and this is used in severe asthma, particularly in patients with a high IG level. Mapolizumab and Benralizumab are all anti-IL-5 agents. This is again used in severe asthma with eosinophilia. Trichafta is a three drug fixed combination which is used in cystic fibrosis. This contains Evacaftor, Tesacaftor and Alexacaftor. Prostenoids, endothelin receptor antagonists like Basentan, PDE5 inhibitors like Sildenafil and Riosiguat are all used for management of pulmonary hypertension. Now, Indicatirol and Oledatirol are long acting once daily LABAs which have been currently introduced for management of COPD and bronchial asthma. Thyotropium, Revifenesin and Umiclidinium again are the longer acting LAMAs, long acting muscarinic antagonists, once daily agents which are available in the management of COPD. Systemic glucocorticoids. So, as far as uh, pulmonary diseases are concerned, what are the diseases where you will opt for systemic glucocorticoids? One, hypersensitive pneumonitis. Two, eosinophilic pneumonia. Three, NSIP, which is usually associated with an underlying CTD. And finally, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. These are the four conditions. Hypersensitive pneumonitis, eosinophilic pneumonia, NSIP. So, basically the CTD associated ILDs and cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Antifibrotic drugs, so particularly to be used in IPF, pyrfenidone and nintedanib. And with that, we've come to our end on our quick recall of the most salient points which are required to uh, get through most of the questions as far as the respiratory system is concerned for MRCP part 1. I really hope this has been helpful. Please go back, attempt a few MCQs after this in the respiratory system and do let us know if this has actually been helpful. Thank you. This is Dr. Aditi for Raw Online.